Something Evil Lurks in My Woods by Sam Sara Hi Swamp Dweller, my name is Sam, and I live in a rural town in Michigan with my family. This includes myself, my twin sister Molly, my younger sisters Naya and Sierra, and our parents. I'm 19 years old and I've always loved the outdoors. I hike and rock climb regularly. Alright, now that you know a little bit about me, let me tell you about the strange events that occurred the other night. My little sister had their friend Jules over for a sleepover, and we were all giggling up in the room having a good time late into the night. Sometime around 11 p.m., Molly went into the younger girl's room to join the fun. I stayed in my bed because, well, I was honestly just really comfy where I was and pretty tired. Sometime around midnight, maybe a little bit later, I heard a series of deep, guttural screams coming from what I thought was the girl's room. You know, at first I paid no mind to the noises until I got a text from Naya that made the hair on the back of my neck go straight up. Did you hear them? The text read. I knew exactly what my sister was referring to. Yeah, I thought it was you guys. I responded. No, they came from the woods. Another spine tingling text lit up my phone. I ran into my little sister's room, and when I entered, Naya screamed and Molly nearly leapt out of her skin. So, to say the least, they were on edge. We sat as silently as we could for a few minutes until the next series of screams echoed through the woods right outside the room. What are they? Sierra asked sleepily. I think what terrified me the most was that we were all in an unspoken agreement that there was a them that was making the noises. It wasn't just the wind or a frog or some other normal creature. This was something supernatural, and we all knew it. Could it be coyotes? Naya asked. No, Molly responded. They sound much different than this. Guys, I'm scared. Sierra chimed in. Being the youngest of us, Sierra was not uncommon in making comments like this, but this time, we were all in agreement. We were all scared. Jules, who had been sleeping through this ordeal, woke up just enough to get the words, I don't want to play this game anymore, and then fell back asleep. We were all confused by her comment, but eventually moved past it. Should we, like, have Dad go out there? Naya asked anxiously. Why don't you go out there? Molly snapped back. She hardly ever raises her voice, so we knew she was scared too. We ultimately decided that we would all go out there together, as a unit, as a team. You know, strength in numbers or whatever. Looking back, I don't know why we thought we could protect ourselves from whatever evil awaited in the woods. But we gingerly trudged into the darkness, one by one, flashlights in hand. We decided to stay in our big group instead of splitting up because even though it took us longer to search the woods that way, we weren't about to end up like idiots in horror movies. After scouring the woods for what felt like hours but was no more than ten minutes, we heard the screams again. This time, they were closer than ever, right next to us, but all around at the same time. There were at least a half a dozen of them. All of us frantically whipped our heads around, trying to see whatever was making those god-awful noises. When suddenly, Naya whimpered, Guys, we all turned around to see where her flashlight was pointing. And there, standing nearly as tall as the tree it was next to, was this hideous, lanky creature. It was pale and tall, with some sort of vile essence to it. It looked like it had never seen an ounce of sunlight. Its fingers were long and spindly, but there were only four fingers in each hand. I moved my gaze to its face, as if you could even call it that. Where this thing's face should be, all there was was a set of small black circles, which I can only presume were its eyes, and a sick eerie smile that stretched across its face. Its teeth protrude from the gums like long, dirty thorns on a branch. 
Its ribs are showing through its skin on its torso like bars through a frosted glass window. We all stood there with our eyes fixed on this creature who just watched us. Then it opened its mouth, and what happened next was hard for me to even, to even remember or even write down. It spoke. I don't want to play this game anymore. The creature mimicked Jules. What the hell? Molly whispered. We were all too stunned to move. Then, all of a sudden, we were surrounded by a whole troop of these things. Everywhere I looked, there was another one of these pale white creatures. I don't want to play this game anymore. They chanted over and over again. I told everybody to run, and we all scattered off in different directions. Once I reached the edge of the forest, I stopped to catch my breath. I heard Jules yell at me from deeper into the woods. Sam, run! She screamed breathlessly with one of them hot on her heels. I made a beeline for the door to our shed because it was the closest form of safety. The rest of the girls followed Molly and me into the shed, and Naya locked the door behind us. Are they gone? Sierra whispered, but before anyone had time to answer, there was a banging on the side of the tin walls of the shed. They had followed us out of the woods. We huddled in a circle close together as, as we were just absolutely terrified and hours away from the sun. Eventually, the sun would shine through the tiny window on the top of the shed and the banging stopped, and we all assumed they were finally gone. We opened the shed door cautiously in case the creatures were still lurking, and thankfully they were nowhere to be seen. We ran towards the house as fast as we could and locked the door behind us. Then we all returned to Naya and Sierra's room, and we passed out on the floor until we woke up around noon. Our mom was unhappy at how late we slept in, and we told her we were just up late talking. We knew she wouldn't believe the truth. The Father Thing by J.O.Pick I was lucky enough to have grown up in the 80s and 90s when people could think about buying a house in central London without being oligarchs or oil babies. It was a two-floor Victorian flat with a large garden, just around the corner from the Natural History Museum, which is truly unique when I look back on it. I was somewhere around six years old and my father was increasingly traveling more for work, which was unusual. It was the middle of the day and my grandmother, mother, and older sister were downstairs in the kitchen and dining room, which led to the garden. I don't know what spurred me on, but I went up the spiral staircase, running as a part of some game where I enthusiastically would be running full pelt. I remember feeling happy, breathlessly excited, and then a sudden, jarring, emotional turn. I remember stopping dead in my tracks with a deep fear like every fiber of my being was screaming at me that there was danger and something was off. Even writing this now can evoke that feeling, and the hairs on my body stand on end. I don't like recalling memories and rarely tell this story. At the top of the stairs was a landing between the living room and my parents' room. My parents' room was a wall of mirrors that contained closets. My dad was standing in front of the old small TV adjusting his bow tie. My quote-unquote dad, who absolutely couldn't be there because he was at work, turns to me and gestures me to come over to me. I was being called into the room with a familiar smile and a friendly gesture. My frozen apprehension broke at that point, and sheer terror took over me. I bolted down the stairs as fast as possible. I had always hesitated about running down those stairs as fast as I could climb them, as I had previously toppled down and knocked out my front tooth when I was younger. No such hesitation existed in this moment. Without trepidation, I threw myself down and immediately sought out my Irish grandmother, who wore those long, flowing dresses and clung to her dress for dear life. I could tell she was a bit surprised. At the time, I didn't know how to express my feelings or really explain what happened in any sort of understandable way. I just clung on to her for a while. My granny could tell that something was wrong but didn't press me for answers, which was an odd response given her character and how I was behaving. It would be a long time before I could convey this story to anyone in any rational sense. At the time, I felt like I needed to be right with her and safe. Honestly. After doing a lot of research, 
I think what I saw was some sort of doppelganger, shapeshifter, or maybe just an evil spirit. But I think it falls into this cryptid category. I saw a skimwalker by Anonymous. About two months ago, my husband and I stayed in a camper on a friend's property in northern Wisconsin. One night, I wasn't feeling very well, so I went and laid down in the camper and promptly fell asleep. A few hours later, sometime around 3 a.m., I suddenly woke up, bolted at the door, and started projectile vomiting outside by the window. My husband called out and asked if I was okay. I managed to say I was fine in between rounds. When I finally finished and felt like I was okay to go back and lay down, I spit a few more times to get rid of the taste. As I looked up, there was a face about three feet in front of me in the darkness. I stared at it, and it stared at me. I was petrified and couldn't move, but I was also afraid to take my eyes off it. I slowly moved my head up and down, side to side, trying to figure out and get a better angle of whatever the heck this thing was. It slowly began to mimic my movements. There we were in the forest darkness, bobbing up, down, back, and forth slowly, leaning closer and closer to one another as we tried to figure each other out. I stared straight into its cold, hollow eyes. I couldn't look away, fearing what would happen if I did. I stared back at it, and it stared back at me, almost as if we didn't know what we were doing. It was too dark to make out any features, but the face had a shape of a human face but I could see the body behind it was more hunched over and distorted looking. We stayed that way for what felt like forever until I finally managed to call out, Uh, babe? Yeah, my husband responded. There's something out here, I said only slightly raising my voice. He asked what was going on and I told him I don't know, some kind of animal. I told him I'm too afraid to move. Eventually, he opened the door and looked out the camper into the darkness. He asked me where, unable to see anything. It's right in front of me, just watching, I told him, bewildered that he couldn't notice it. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it in front of me, and just as quickly as I had seen it, it had vanished into thin air. There was nothing there. I never saw it leave, I never saw it walk away. It was just keeping that cold, dead gaze on me the whole time. How could it not be there? I definitely still need clarification on this interaction. I know it was there, I saw what I saw, it wasn't a dream, and I know I wasn't hallucinating. I was just simply sober, I never smoked, I still never smoke, I don't drink, I still don't drink. Can anybody tell me what they think this was? What I Found by Anonymous Sitting on the western side of the Missouri River is Omaha, Nebraska, a large metropolis that has been Nebraska's largest city for many years. It has witnessed many historical events throughout its almost 170 years. Like many cities, Omaha had many ethnic neighborhoods where new immigrants settled down with people of their kind. A section of town known for its meatpacking plants appropriately named South Omaha became the home of many Eastern Europeans, Poles, Czechs, Germans, Lithuanians, Slavics, Croatians, and more all resided here. However, many of these slaughterhouses closed as years passed and the area changed forever. A few remain, but the days of massive feedlots are gone. Growing up here, I was always told stories about South Omaha and its past. Many old buildings remained to act as silent monuments to the old days and often mesmerized me in my youth. I wanted to see these old buildings, some old slaughterhouses, factories, even old breweries that Omaha was once famous for. One building stood out to me though. One of the old slaughterhouses lay close to the train tracks that cut South Omaha in half. This building was massive with almost five stories. It was very long, about three complete football fields wide. Built of brick and steel, this old building was a testament to the people of this city. However, I heard it would soon be demolished and was instantly saddened by the news. 
Hearing about urban exploration over the internet always piqued my interest, but I was always too nervous about trespassing. Since this building was set to be demolished, I decided to go and see it before it became a parking lot. I set out of my truck on a fantastic fall evening to see this behemoth of a building. I brought my heavy LED mag light and dressed in light hiking gear to avoid looking conspicuous. The slaughterhouse lay near the train tracks in a more deserted area of South Omaha. Around it were other buildings adorned with the same red and white brick that this building also wore. Many tall grasses and empty lots surrounded the building, all the while a chain link fence surrounded the entire complex that was the slaughterhouse. I was prepared for this and parked some distance away on a side street near a garage. Walking towards the building, I became aware of its immense size. It indeed was magnificent and occupied a mammoth amount of space. The fence did not feature a barbed wire top so that I could climb over. The minute I stepped onto the ground after the fence, I felt a strange sensation from inside me. Nervousness? Fright? I guess both if I had to really give a guess. Whatever it was, it remained with me as I proceeded on. I approached a door with a window on the side of the building. Whatever logo or name had been affixed to it before had long worn off and the glass was covered in dirt and grime. I tried the handle and it would not budge. I felt the door loose and figured it could probably be opened with some force. I eventually got it open after bashing my shoulder into it, accidentally breaking the lock. Oh well, I thought. It was going to be torn down anyway. I entered the slaughterhouse and flicked on my flashlight. As I stepped into the pitch blackness, I was greeted with a large open room that featured lots of decrepit machinery undoubtedly used for meat processing. The walls and floor were tile, easy cleaning, shouldn't be too long to do that. Long conveyor belts were shaking and snaking through the room strewn with dust and cobwebs. Control stations, desk, and more surrounded me. None of this, though, looked like it had been touched for many years. I made my way through the mess of machinery and dust until I reached a pair of double doors. I pushed them open slightly into another large room. But as I did, something, something changed. It suddenly became frigidly cold, which was odd because it was only 65 degrees out. So sure, it wasn't like hot, but it wasn't cold either and there was no wind at all. It felt like winter had come into this room alone. I shivered but pressed on. The next room was what I presumed to be the killing floor. It had a significant main pathway for the cattle to move through and then conveyor belts to carry them to the next station to be dressed. Now, living near the stockyards all my life, I have become used to the smells that emanate from this part of town. The smell that hit me as I browsed this room was on a different level, though. It was not a familiar smell of cow poop or burnt meat, but of death, decay, and disease. It was otherworldly. I have read and heard about rotting smell lending itself to wendigos, skinwalkers, and the like, so I was on edge. I tried to convince myself that it was just a dead animal or something more reasonable. I continued to walk through the next room with an absolutely uneasy feeling. Suddenly, a sound like no other shook the room with great ferocity. It was the bellow of a bull. It did not sound normal, though. It sounded like a cry. This was incredibly loud, shrieking like it was about to charge. I looked around quickly to find the scream source, but I couldn't find a damn thing. I continued to move through the room, finally reaching the other end. Bright, shiny tile lined this side of the room, with more conveyor belts, large plastic bins on wheels. As I closed in on these bins, I was in a state of absolute shock. These bins were full of bones. They were massive bones, obviously from cows. How could they still be here? This place has been out of operation for close to 40 years. The bones were still bloody and smelled fresh. I was about to start freaking out at this point, honestly. I looked down and saw the floor was covered in blood from these bins. I quickly stepped back and nearly slipped on the tile. As I did this, I noticed a light from one of the doors near my end. Two red eyes appeared in the dark, and I leaned closer to see what it was. Suddenly, another loud bellow rang through the room, and those eyes got closer. 
I could hear hooves on the tile floor. I sprinted from my spot, bolted through the door, and got to the other side of the room. Once through the door, I ran down a hall lined with shiny tile. I followed this hallway, hoping to find my way out. I expected the bull to find me, or maybe just leave me alone entirely, but I was still determined. I reached the end of the hallway and approached the doorway with rubber flaps across it like you would see at a butcher shop. I pressed through and turned to the right but stopped dead. A faint red light bulb exposed a workstation with multiple men cleaning a cow. They, they wore long white smocks, helmets, goggles, and rubber boots. One was spraying down the cow, the other was cutting a part off, and the last was moving some bones to a bin. I couldn't believe my eyes. How is this possible? Did some meat packing still take place? That couldn't be possible, there's no way. As I stepped more into the room, I heard something unusual. They weren't speaking English. It sounded almost uh, Eastern European, maybe Polish. It had to be. I remember my grandparents speaking Polish to me occasionally. With my grandfather being full-blooded Polish, I was still in awe what I was seeing. I needed to get by these guys to leave, so I started to move past them. I don't know how, but they heard me and all turned to look. Everyone stopped what they were doing. Three bespeckled men stared at me with only the dim red light exposing them. I froze in my tracks and knew I was trespassing. One man shouted something in Polish to me and began moving my way. The others followed. I fled to the other door and sprinted as fast as possible down the hallway. I heard their footsteps behind me, but their gear must have slowed them down somewhat, because I outran them. Soon, I found an exterior door and bashed it open. I was on the other side of the slaughterhouse but quickly found the road on the west end of the lot, leading me back to the truck. Eventually I did feel safer outside, now that I could catch my breath, walk around and hide. While doing so, I took one more glance towards the building. My legs froze at what I saw. I saw the three men looking at me through an open truck dock. They looked the same, except they had red, glowing eyes. I began to run now, losing my mind in fear. As I saw my truck up the road, another bull bellow echoed through the street and hurt my ears. How could this be happening? I hopped in my car and peeled out of there. Looking in my rear view mirror, I couldn't see anything, but I was forever shaking by what I found. Never again would I explore the abandoned buildings, especially where many animals were killed. What did those men want with me? What would I have done? What was that creature? I have no idea. After doing a bunch of research online, reading a bunch of stuff on Reddit, and even listening to shows like Swamp Dweller, I just kind of think it might have been some sort of skimwalker. I don't know. I don't know what it is that I saw. Bye, Midori. Hey Swamp, it's me again, Midori. This happened a couple of nights ago. So unlike some of the other things I have sent you, the details, at least those that I know, are still fresh in my mind. So for some context, so for some context, this happened at a park called Stolsoft Park. The whole thing is inside of my city. I would say it is maybe a square mile in total area. Sorry, I'm not too familiar with acres. It is mostly forest, with a playground facing the street on the northern end. The playground, along with the north and south entrances, are elevated hill streets, so the forest gradually goes downward, meeting at a valley in the center. The playground is bordered by a forest on two sides. The swing set, where I was, is maybe 10 feet away from the fence separating one side of the playground from the forest. I'm sorry if that is confusing. I should say I usually go swing there anytime between 9 at night and midnight, mainly because I like being the only person in the park. I am not some curmudgeon who does not like kids or anything, I just prefer less crowded places in general. So, on this night I believe it was around 11 something, when I hear shuffling behind the fence. This is not unusual at all, and I don't react in any way. Maybe five minutes later, 
I heard it again, and it sounded like something approximately human-sized. My first thought was a mountain lion. Despite the park posting signs warning of mountain lion activity, I have never actually seen one here. They do not worry me anyway, because a mountain lion will not usually attack or even really care about a human if you don't do something stupid like mess with their young. I have encountered them elsewhere. They generally mind their own business. My next thought was a creeper, and I mentally prepared to jump off and run to my car. At this point, I was looking at the fence. On that night, the moon was not shining per se, but it was casting its glow, giving minimal visibility. At 10 feet away, however, I would at least be able to see movement, especially of this being's assumed size. As I was mulling it over in my head, I heard not exactly what you call a growl, but almost a moaning, I guess. It lasted about five seconds, then I heard something moving away. The weird thing was, the movement came from quite a ways off, in the same direction, and the vocalization came from right at the fence, ten feet away from me. Now at this point, the sensible thing to do would be to just leave, but having just happened, I was dumbfounded and just continued swinging for another 30 seconds or so. And then, of course, it got more strange. As I was swinging, I saw a flashlight in the distance near where the playground hits the streets. This is maybe 60 or 70 feet from me. With obstacles such as play structures and other things in the way, my first thought that it was a police officer or something of the sort. The playground technically is closed, and they all are because of the corona situation, but I've swung at parks after they've been closed for years, and if the police even care about things like that, they've never even bothered me. The guy came a bit closer, but he is moving at an angle towards me in the general sense, but moving at an angle. As in, if you envision the area as a clock with me at 6, he started at 12, and he is moving towards 7. Sorry, that is the only way I can really describe it. 10 feet from the swing set in the opposite direction of the fence, there's a 20 foot by 20 foot metal overhang with one of those fishnet pattern tables for picnics. I hopped off the swing and crouched behind it. In the day, this would be a completely useless hiding place, but at night, a person hiding behind it would just look like a part of a mass of shadow. I watched as it approached, and while I could not make out any details or colors, I could see that he was dressed almost like a hunter from the show Supernatural. He looked to be wearing baggy pants, a vest and a hat, the most common kind of hat with a duckbill on the front, the kind they sell at lids. There looked to be things strapped on his arms and legs. Mind you, visibility was unbelievably bad, and I may have mistaken many of these details. He was carrying a flashlight aimed at the ground in front of him. On his opposite hand, it looked like he had some sort of stick, like a gymnastics baton or something. All I know was the general shape. It occurred to me that if this guy fancied himself a hunter, then a pale girl swinging at midnight is probably the worst thing you can be. Either way, this situation now seemed potentially dangerous. If this person came close, I decided to run for the far fence, leading into the forest. Note that between me and my car, despite the small size of the forest, finding a person hiding in it would be impossible at night. Even with a flashlight, I am completely familiar with the forest. I am currently 27, and I have been coming here since I was 7 or 8 years old. Even in complete darkness, I could navigate it well enough to hide if I had to. As I crouched down, the person stopped briefly, then continued down into the forest entrance. That is basically the ending of our encounter. I waited for a few minutes, and then I tried to see if I could still see it. I am not sure if the two events were related at all. As far as the noise I heard, I know what mountain lions sound like. The only other fauna in the park are deer, squirrels, and insects. I honestly do not know if this was a skimwalker or anything like that. All I heard was the sound. There was no smell, and I did not get necessarily a terrible feeling from that person with the flashlight, even though they were dressed weird. Also, I don't think this force would be big enough to house something like that, but maybe it could be just big enough for something to stop by for a few days. 
We do have a good sized forest farther up in the mountains, not too far away, called Hubbard Park. You probably have to travel about 20 minutes through the suburbs to get there, but I'm not sure that it would be impossible for a skimwalker to bounce between these two locations. Do you guys think I saw a skimwalker? Do you guys think I possibly saw somebody hunting a skimwalker? I don't know. I have seen the dog man by Riri. Hello, swamp dweller. My name is Ree. I want to tell you about my story that I believe is my encounter with the dog man. I've encountered this creature at least three times. I first saw the dog man sometime around 3 a.m. down Paradise Road in Pineville, Louisiana. I was going to a friend's house when I noticed this big dog run in the middle of the road. So I slammed on my brakes and waited for it to cross, but this dog stopped in the middle of the road, stood up on its hind legs like a human, and ran into the woods after, after some time. I, I began to drive again, but I immediately turned around and went home. I was in shock. Now, the second time I saw this creature was a little after 3 a.m. again, and I was riding my friend's crotch rocket. I stopped because I thought someone was standing in the middle of the road until I raised the shield to see it wasn't someone, it was something. And when I hit my brights, the creature got on all fours and ran into the woods. I turned around once again and went back to my friend's house absolutely bewildered. The third time I saw the dog man was in Essler Field. On my way home, I noticed something running in front of the car. I slammed on my brakes hoping I wasn't going to hit whatever it was, but when I opened my eyes, this massive dog, werewolf, I don't even know how to explain it creature, was looking at me through the windshield. I was so scared, I honestly thought this thing was about to break through and kill me. After staring at me for about five or so seconds, this thing took off, walking like a human until it got to the tree line. Then, once again, it got on all fours and disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. I was so scared, I hurried home, hoping this thing wasn't chasing me. When I got home, I got out of the car. When I got on the porch, I heard this ear-piercing howl. And this, my friends, was the last time I think I saw the dog man. Something made me feel hunted. By... Anonymous. I was walking from my boyfriend's house after midnight last night. I've known him for six years, so I've been there all the time and have never felt anything like this. The woods surrounding this estate on side to side make this walk home feel eerie at night. There are only a few houses that are sprinkled here and there. My path to my house overlooks a hill and the woods that are behind me. The entire walk takes maybe about five minutes on a good day. As I was walking, I was fumbling through my pockets to find my airpods when a sudden dread overwhelmed me. This came out of nowhere and surprised me, but I was suddenly paralyzed with fear. I contemplated calling him to go and get me, but I couldn't force myself. I don't know what I thought would happen. But I could feel tears come and I started running. As I approached a clearance, I assumed the air was thick and quiet and everything felt off. I've been walking this same path for six years and I've never felt like this before. To clarify, we live in Ireland, in a relatively safe area. There are usually no large animals or predators in this area. I'm unsure if this belongs here, but... I would love to know your thoughts. I still feel super uneasy and uncomfortable about this. In hindsight, walking at night with AirPods is a very stupid idea. I was lulled into a sense of false security living in a relatively safe area and a neighborhood where rarely anything ever happens. I should also probably add that I'm an immigrant and despite living in Ireland for almost a decade, I don't know anything about fairies and I've seen many people mention in the past when I've told them this story that this could be something to do with fairies. 
In any case, I'm glad nothing wrong happened, but this shook me enough that I'm going to be a lot more careful when I'm walking alone. I stumbled upon something weird. By Anonymous. This happened a while ago, but stuck with me, so I wanted to share it. I was at a friend's house for a weekend with many of my friends, and we all went for a walk. She lives right at the edge of the countryside, where there are fields, woods, and whatnot. So we went down this forest path. This other guy and I started exploring a bit deeper into the trees, and we had gone quite a far ways down into the hills into the thicker trees. But... There was a clearing just beyond that. A big log was lying on the ground, and resting on it was a skinned deer. There were no bones or anything, just the skin and the head and antlers. It was... it was strange. The head was on the log, the eyes were missing, and the skin was wrapped down and draped around it. Beside it was a crucifix made out of really rotten planks. It was all tied up with a bale string. This guy and I freaked out, and I called out to our other friends to come check it out, but he told me not to show them because they'd find it too disturbing. He shook it off and started climbing back up, but I stared at it for ages. He waited for me for so long that he told me to walk away from it after some time. A string attached to the crucifix ran further into the woods, but following it wouldn't be normal for me, so I just went back. I still can't comprehend what it was. Some kind of pagan ritual? Some kind of cult? Maybe some sort of prank? Not many people walk this forest path besides locals walking their dogs, and we had come pretty far off path. My friend also said that people didn't hunt these woods because that was not permitted here. So I didn't really push it with the questioning since I didn't really want to go too far deep into it while I was already out there. Now, while I come to the realization I probably don't want to know what was out there in the woods behind my house, I find the lack of answers has me thinking about it more and more. I guess if I would have died out there or whatever, I wouldn't have to live with this. But I do believe like it was the beginning of a horror movie, where all my friends and I would be killed off one by one by some sort of forest witch or supernatural monster. Maybe it's some sort of bad omen or something like that. If anybody has any idea, let me know. I'd love to have some more clarity. Shot at in Yosemite by Cali Coast My friend was on a solo backpacking trip through Yosemite National Park. He started talking to a guy he met on this trail about his trip. The guy said he often did solo trips as well, but would never solo again after experiencing something horrific on his last journey. The guy said he was two days into a six-day hike in the middle of the desolate wilderness when he came upon a dead man in a suit with a bullet hole in his head, and the body was very fresh. He never heard any gunshots and he could see no sign of anyone else around. He was filled with dread and felt like he was being watched at all directions. He took off running back down the trail in the direction from where he came from. He hiked back to the trailhead for about two days and two nights without rest. He said the nighttime was absolutely the worst. Every little noise he heard and the shadows he saw felt like somebody or something was stalking him through the dark. Eventually, upon his return, he told authorities about it, but never heard back from them. He wondered if maybe the man was shot and thrown from a helicopter. My friend said he had to stay with a group for a few nights after hearing that story, and even cut his trip short, feeling pretty spooked himself out there in the wilderness. So, suffice to say, all in all from this short, small, little scary tale, be safe out there and trust no one but yourself. Strange Encounters on the PCT by Lucid Friends This past year I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. 
There were about 600 miles of trail I hiked and camped all by myself. One of the sections I was alone on was in Northern California, slightly north of Shasta. I got to a beautiful spot and knew it was the best spot to set up my camp. It was absolutely gorgeous and had 360 views of everywhere around me. I could see the views of the woods in the valley below and the mountains everywhere. I could see it raining on Mount Shasta. It's my favorite campsite in NorCal. I still remember the exact mile marker and have some sight footage during daylight and nightlight hours. I set up my tent and after admiring the sunset, I went to bed. I could see outside below the vestibule when I was lying down in my tent. As I tried to sleep, I noticed a white light in the valley, maybe about a quarter to a half mile away, not near my tent or anything. I wasn't close to any towns. I would see an occasional remote cabin in the woods in Sierra Nevadas, but nothing too much, so I figured it was probably that. But there needed to be an access point or dirt roads or something. There were no forest clearings, just thick woods surrounded by mountains. I looked at the light briefly and tried to think of what it could have been. But this was a pretty remote place, so I really couldn't think of anything. I was tired from hiking all day and didn't think much of it, if I'm honest. A little while later, I looked at it again and noticed another light. It was an orange light slowly circling the white light. It was gradually morphing in shape as it circled. I watched it for quite some time, trying to understand what I was looking at. It had a very calm motion, and it was almost mesmerizing. It wasn't like many people's UFO or orb experiences where it darts around and then vanishes. I eventually fell asleep. It started raining around midnight, and I looked out my tent and still saw both lights. One white stationary light and one orange morphing light. I woke up again sometime around 4 a.m. to use the bathroom. I walked outside my tent, and it was still there, using the same motion. I tried to get a video, but due to the distance and darkness, it looked like another shitty video that didn't show anything. I woke up around sunrise and looked for it, but neither light was there. I didn't see these lights at around sunset or sunrise, only darkness. I know these would have been visible during the sunset and sunrise too if they were still there. I'm racking my brain, but I'm sure there has to be an explanation. But I genuinely have no clue as to what it was that I saw, and I'm still trying to figure it out. A typical dog walk turns out to be not so typical. Bye. Anonymous. Hi, Swamp Dweller. I don't know if you'd be interested in a story from England. It's kind of long-winded, and not necessarily the most terrifying thing. But it's a weird and scary experience that me and my partner will never forget. To set the scene, we live in a busy city in the South Midlands of England. We have a bully breed dog and take him out for walks in the surrounding parks and woods quite often. I'm quite into the paranormal, and have experienced lots of things. My mom is a spiritual medium, so I guess it comes with the territory. My partner, however, is a science graduate and is a very everything-has-an-explanation sort of person. Anyway, on this day we decided to go to a popular picnic park just on the outskirts of the city. It's almost always full of families, dog walkers, and picnickers. It was late spring, and the temperature was just starting to hit summer heat. It was a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and no wind. The park was full of the usual, parents and kids with their families and dogs, old couples going for walks and the like. Here in England, bully breeds are still quite stigmatized and feared, so we usually avoid going where there are lots of people. Not that our dog is dangerous or anything, he's just overly friendly and people freak out when he trots up to greet them. So we decided to go off the beaten track. To give you a rough idea, the park has a small lake in the center, with paths and benches that surround it. Just off one of those paths are a few farmer's fields in a thick wooded area which snakes around into another path which eventually leads back to the park. 
we decided to go through the cattle gate, which leads up through the farmer's fields. It was so hot and beautiful that day that nothing spooky or creepy even crossed our minds. Even though you could no longer see anyone, you could still hear kids playing and dogs barking in the distance. As we came up to the wooded area, whilst still on the dirt path alongside it, I noticed a man walking through the thick brush. I thought it was weird because he was coming from the opposite end of the woods which literally leads to nothing. No houses or roads or anything of the likes. Just endless fields and woods. I just told myself, oh, he must be looking for his dog or something. My partner noticed him too and we shared a look to each other like, what a weirdo, and carried on walking. But I couldn't help but look at him. He looked so strange. It must have been close to 30 degrees and he was in a thick black hoodie black trousers, or sweats, he had longish dirty blonde hair, and maybe around our age, so mid-twenties. But what was more strange is he had a dazed sort of smile on his face and his head kind of tilted to one side. When he walked, he swayed from side to side slightly. I tried to push it to the back of my mind, telling myself that he was just a stoner or something looking for his dog. He wasn't calling or making noises to get a dog's attention or anything which was even more strange to me. Anyway, I kept looking back over my shoulder. He was in the brush for a little while longer, but then joined the path we were on and began walking our way. He must have been about 30 feet behind us. I noticed how tall he was now that we were on the same path and how broad he was. He must have been about six foot nine, closer to seven. He was huge, maybe 17 or 18 stone so something like 240 to 250 pounds more or less. Around this point, we noticed everything was silent. There were no kids laughing, no indistinctive family chatter, no dogs barking, no birds tweeting, nothing. The only sound that I could discern was the sound of our footsteps in the wind. But there was no wind. It was roasting hot, not even a slight breeze yet. We could hear wind blowing through the trees. Even though the sun was beating down, it felt darker somehow. Like everything was, I don't know, desaturated. My partner started to freak out, and strangely, so did our dog. Now this really struck me as weird. Our boy's the kind of dog who would greet anyone, run up to them to play. But no, he wouldn't even look back at me or the man. My partner and dog started to speed up to get away from the wooded area this weird behemoth of a man was in. I really started to freak out myself, but don't want to upset my partner even further, so I kept my cool, quiet, and kept my pace. I looked over my shoulder again and he was closer, maybe 25 feet away. Now for a bit of context, as you exit the wooded area, you come to a path which is surrounded on either side with tall, thick bushes, and it curves around widely to lead you back to the main park. The curve is so wide that you can see far ahead, but you can only see the bushes where it curves. Neither of the exits are in view. As we reach this path, I check again, and the guy is closer still. It's still silent. All I can hear is the faint wind sounds in our footsteps, but nothing from the man. He's smiling still in that dazed sort of way, and still is kind of swaying. Everything still felt weird and dull, and that's the only way I can describe it. I thought to myself, if this weird bloke is going to try something, I'm going to have to protect my partner. I'm only 5'8 myself, and not much of a fighter. So I grabbed my car keys and put them between my fingers in my pocket. If this dude wanted to try anything, I'd smash him in the face and leg it. I'm not fast either, but I convinced myself I'd be faster than him. I check over my shoulder again, and he is still close. I start to hype myself up. He was coming and I was ready. I realized I couldn't hear him at all though. He was probably about 15 feet behind me now. My partner and dog had literally hightailed it up the path, but why couldn't I hear any footsteps from him? Another quick glance and he was right behind me, five feet or so. This was it. If I was going to do anything, it had to be now. If I could keep the element of surprise on my side, I might be able to stand a chance and give us the opportunity to run. I swung around as quick as I could and went to shout out at him and swipe at him, but he was gone. There was nothing there, no man or no sign of him whatsoever. I paused and looked around. He couldn't have run back along the path. He couldn't be that quick. 
I would still be able to see him as the path winds around so widely he would still be in view. He couldn't have jumped through either side of the path into the rows of bushes as I would have heard it and seen the rustling of the bushes or the hole he would have made. He had simply vanished. I stayed there for a moment and only when I decided to walk on to check on my other half and the dog that I realized I could hear the park again. The wind noises had gone and the day returned to normal. The sunlight was no longer dull and everything seemed normal. I got shivers and ran to catch up. I asked my partner if they had seen him go anywhere but they didn't see anything. They just said he really freaked them out and they didn't want to be there anymore. I could see that they were really shaken up. The dog was back to normal though, wagging his tail and wanting to play and explore. We decided to cut our walk short and drive home. After we got home, I rang my mom and told her all about it. She advised me to check reports for missing people or deaths related to that area, which I did and weirdly enough, lots of people have died there by suicide or overdoses, but none of the people I found online matched this description. I tried to forget about it and get back to normal life and all that. I was applying to go back to college at the time, so I didn't really need to be thinking about giant ghost men. After a few days, it had left our minds and we got back to normality. A few nights later, I wake up in the middle of the night and open my eyes. As they adjust to our darkness, I look up at the ceiling where the orange glow of the street lamp shines through our window, and my heart stops. He was there, stood over our bed. He was so tall with his head just below the ceiling light. He still had that weird dazed smile all lit up with the orange glow. I jump up and punch at him as hard as I can, but my fist doesn't meet anything, because there was nothing there. I turned on the light and looked around, found nothing. I absolutely ransacked the house and found not a single person. I've never seen him since, but after seeing him in our bedroom, our apartment felt horrid afterwards. It never felt homey or safe again, and we would hear horrible things. For example, at one point in the middle of the night, I heard my own voice call my partner's name from the other side of our bedroom. We heard walking in our attic, which was too low for people to walk in, and our pets would not sleep alone. They would always growl at corners of the house. We left that flat after a year or so of dealing with the weird ghostly experiences. My partner, of course, kept denying that it was a ghost. She just said that it couldn't be explained. My Weird Stories While Being a Logger by Anonymous The logging company I work for is tasked with clearing a large land for a housing development. While walking the ground, I spot several hickory trees grouped together. I note the location as I plan on taking them for myself over the weekend while everyone else is at home, resting for the previous work week. Some barbecue places in my area will pay good money for a load of hickory. That Saturday, I load my chainsaws and busting mauls in the bed of my truck and head toward the job site. At the entrance, a group of people gathers, protesting the clearing of the land. Save the animals' natural habitat or something. Save the animals' natural habitat or something like that. Those animals don't help me pay the bills, and until they do, I'm clearing it out. The protesters block the entrance. I slowly pull up, roll down my window, and politely ask them to move. The protesters stand firm. I push down on the gas pedal for a moment, giving one of them a bump with the front of my truck. I continued to do this until they finally decided to move out of my way. I creep into the entrance, continuing to push protesters aside with my truck. The last protester screamed in my window. These trees give us oxygen and provide habitat for thousands of animals. Screw the animals, I said as I spit in her face, quickly driving away before any retaliation could take place. It doesn't take long to find the hickories as I remember their exact location. Ten hickories in all. It's hard work cutting them, busting them up into manageable pieces, loading the truck down, and making several trips from barbecue restaurants to this location. I dread dealing with the rude protesters every trip, but the extra money would be worth it. I down the first three trees no problem. This old saw I had restored was cutting through the wood like butter. 
I was ready to lay down the fourth hickory when I got distracted by movement in my peripheral vision. During this distraction, the saw kicks back, almost tearing into my leg. I drop the saw. I look down to see a rip in my jeans where I saw the blade caught it. That was too close. I say aloud, my heart racing from the close call. I spin around, ready to scream out profanities and belittle the little jackass protester that distracted me and almost led to the destruction of my leg. To my surprise, no protester was in sight, only a giant buck. Its rack was huge, 14 pointer at least. I'm an avid hunter and I don't think I've ever even seen one this big. If only I had my rifle handy. I'd have a nice head to mount on my wall, and some nice meat for the freezer. Then something unexpected happened. The buck's eyes started to glow red. I investigate them, almost hypnotized by the red glow. I was in such a trance, I didn't hear the snap and pop of the now falling tree behind me. The tree glanced off my shoulder and into the side of my knee, collapsing me to the ground. The massive tree was still on top of my leg, pinning me to the ground. I let out a scream that I thought for sure one of the protesters would be able to hear. But after laying on the ground for several minutes in pure agony, it became clear they had not heard me. I began to assess the damage. My jeans were beginning to turn red from the blood. I stick my fingers into the rip previously caused by the chainsaw and rip the jeans. I continue to tear away at the fabric until only the seam connects the lower part of my jeans to the upper part. I roll the jeans up as tightly as possible, the flesh tender to the touch. I get the jeans just above the knee, and I can now see the bone protruding from my skin just below the knee. I get a slightly light head and must turn my head away, the sight of blood and bone sending a sickening feeling through my stomach. I must try hard not to vomit or pass out. I try yelling again. I scream until my voice is hoarse, but no one can seemingly hear me. No one is coming. I can't lay here for two more days, pinned under this tree, waiting for my friends and co-workers to come. I must do something. I plant my free foot on the massive hickory and began to push. The tree trunk starts to rock back and forth with each thrust of my leg. I try this repeatedly for what feels like hours, but I don't have the strength to push it off. I finally give up out of exhaustion. Days turn to night, and I begin to give up hope. I lay on my back staring up at the stars. This would be peaceful if not for the throbbing pain in my lower leg. Finally I pass out. I'm not sure if it was from exhaustion or blood loss, but I welcomed it. I woke up to a sharp pain shooting up my leg. I sit up to find myself surrounded by a pack of coyotes, one nod at my exposed bone while another lapped up fresh blood now pouring from my wound. Nipping at my crusted over scabs like I had not eaten in months, a pop sends a shockwave of pain through me as one of the coyotes sinks its teeth through my hard exterior of my bone. A swift kick to the head of one of them sent a few of them in retreat, but they continued to hover around licking the blood from the fur around their mouths, waiting for me to slip back into unconsciousness so they could finish their meal. That's not assholes. I'm not giving up that easy. The rest of the night was spent trying to roll the massive tree off my leg until I gave out. I would rest for a while and try again, all while keeping the coyotes at bay. Just before sunlight, I heard massive footsteps in the distance that sent the coyotes into a panic to run as they disappeared into the forest. Help. Please help. I try to yell, trying to get the attention of whatever was causing the footsteps. That's when the buck from before appears from behind the trees and walks directly up to me. The buck is standing over me, peering down at me with those glaring red eyes. You did this to me, didn't you? The buck lets out a snort in response to my question. What's next? The buck turned its eyes to the sky as five vultures circled. I'm sorry, I don't want to die. Tears are streaming down my cheeks. I'll quit the logging business. I'll never cut down another tree if I live. Please help me. 
The buck tilts its head to the side as if it was contemplating whether I should live or die. It lets out another grunt. His eyes, red, begin to glow brighter. My light begins to fade as darkness overtakes me. I wake up several days later in the hospital, part of me hoping that it was only a nightmare, but the notion is ripped away at my absence of my leg, amputated from the knee down. After recovering, I went home and sold my chainsaws, busting malls, axes. I even sold my wood-burning grill and got charcoal. I'm not sure where the local barbecue restaurants will get their wood now, but it sure as hell won't be from me. The crew unloaded the last piece of equipment and prepared to clear out the 100 acres of timber. My boss, Larry, has been trying to buy this land for years from an old lady that refused to sell. Over the years, the two began to be very hateful towards each other. I went in with him on many attempts to talk to this lady about selling the land. She politely told Larry to leave. When he refused and continued pitching his proposal, she disappeared into her house. Larry paced in front of the door a few times, visibly aggravated at her disappearance and the fact that she wouldn't hear him out. A few moments later, she came back to the door with a broom in hand. Leave, or I'll hit you. Ma'am, we both know you're not going to hit me. Please hear me out. A loud thump grabs my attention as I look up to see the business end of the broom go across Larry's head. He blocks the second shot with his forearm before fleeing off the porch and back to his truck. A few months go by. The old lady, I found out her name was Grace, passed away. Someone broke into her house and put a knife to her throat. The police described a brutal scene of furniture overturned, blood-soaked carpet, and the lifeless eyes of Grace staring back at them. The knife had cut so deep that it almost decapitated the poor woman. After months of investigation, the case went cold with very little evidence being left behind from the killer. The bank took possession of her land. Larry contacted the bank and purchased the land from them. Of course, the thought of Larry committing this gruesome crime has crossed our minds. It seems out of the ordinary for Larry. He seems like a genuinely nice guy outside of work. 100 acres is enough for him to make a nice profit, but... Hardly enough to kill over, right? Other than the half acre the woman's house sat on, the rest was nothing but forest. 99 acres of timber for the crew to harvest and sell. Despite the rumblings of the crew and the town thinking Larry would do something so brutal, our crew eagerly began working and clearing the timber. For the first week, everything went as expected. When the team and I started to notice things we couldn't explain. Small things at first. All five of the gas canisters that held the fuel for the chainsaws were tipped over, causing the fuel to leak out into the ground. Plug wires removed from the spark plug, a cut pull cord on a chainsaw, several things that would halt work but not stop us from fixing the problem and continuing within minutes. Things quickly escalated. We returned from lunch and someone had drained the coolant from our knuckle boom loader. I had inspected the machine myself that morning and knew that there were no leaks, and it was full of coolant. That caused the loader to overheat and break down, effectively stalling our work for weeks until it was fixed. Once again, things escalated even more. My coworker Billy and I worked together for almost a decade cutting timber. We had become close friends. Our wives were friends as well, and we hung out quite often outside of work. Knowing him well makes what he did next out of the ordinary. On this day, everything seemed normal. One luxury we didn't have in the forest was a working restroom. Sometimes we must do what we must. Billy grabbed a roll of toilet paper from his truck and went out into the dense trees to do his business. Upon return, Billy appeared to be on edge. He looked pale white and only responded with, It's nothing. Everything is fine. When asked if he was okay, he then left for the day complaining of an upset stomach, only to call Larry later to inform him he was resigning from his job. This wasn't like Billy. He loved his career. It's all he knew. 
I tried calling only to get voicemail or send him a text and get no response. As strange as this was, we continued without him. After a hard morning of work, the crew went to a local restaurant for lunch, but I decided to save a little money that day and bring my own. I stood at the job site to eat my bologna sandwich and a bag of Cheetos. I sat down on a stump and bit into my sandwich, regretting my decision to go with plain white bread instead of the sweet Hawaiian. The sound of a rock hitting the ground grabs my attention. I look up to see the rock bounce a few times and come to a rest at the base of the stump I sat on. What the hell? My thoughts were interrupted by a second rock being launched into my forehead. I looked around and I didn't see anyone. Real funny. Throwing rocks is kind of childish. I looked around, expecting to see one of the guys returning from their lunch. Another rock collides with my chest. This time I noticed what direction the stone came from. I stand up, peering in the direction I believe the rock had been thrown. I see some slight movement coming from behind a tree. I slowly walk up to the tree expecting to round it and see one of the jackass employees I work with screwing with me. Instead, I see the fiery eyes of Grace staring back at me. I stumble backward at the sight of the dead woman, my foot catching a tree root and sending me to the ground on my back. Grace loosened her tense jaw to speak. Get off my land. Don't touch another tree, or I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. Then, I'll be waiting for you in death. I pick myself up off the ground quickly and run back to my truck, hop in and peel out, never looking back. More guys left after I did, all having similar stories of their own, but Larry refused to pull the crew and equipment off the land. He paid for it, it was his now, and he would make his money from it. Two months after I quit, what was left of the crew showed up one morning to find Larry hanging from one of the trees that was set to be cut down. Cops were called and, in many years, nobody knows if it was actually murder or a suicide. Officially, it was ruled as a suicide, though. If I was a betting man, I would put money on Grace having something to do with it from beyond the grave. One thing I was sure of, when Larry took his final breath, I know exactly who is there waiting for him. The Devil in the Bathroom by... Anonymous. I was six years old. My older sister was nine. The year was 1982. My mom and dad went out somewhere that night and got us a babysitter. We lived in a tiny, two-story, two-bedroom apartment with one bathroom that was upstairs. Our babysitter was a teenage girl who lived two doors down. The babysitter kept us occupied. We were all coloring at the table. I had to go to the bathroom, but was scared to go upstairs alone. I don't really remember ever being scared in that house before this day. I asked my sister if she would come with me to the bathroom. She said no because she was occupied coloring. I kept asking, almost begging her if she would go with me, but she kept saying no. Finally, the babysitter got sick of me asking, yelled at me, and told me to go to the bathroom alone because my sister did not want to go. I remember being so scared as I walked up those stairs alone. Before I knew it, I was standing on the top landing. The small hallway was dark, and so was the bathroom. I stood there on the landing, tilting my head in front of the doorway. The only part of my body entering the bathroom was my tiny hand to flip on the light switch as I stepped up to the last stair into the hallway. The lights were those horrible fluorescent tube lights that flickered for moments before coming on. As I flipped the light switch, the lights dimly turned on, flickering. At that moment, in the dim light, I saw it. The devil was sitting on the rim of the bathtub. It was what you would almost picture in your mind was a stereotypical looking devil. It was red, had horns, and a tail. It sat there on the rim of the bathtub, motionless, silent, and we locked eyes for what seemed like an eternity. Honestly, I was petrified, and I couldn't move physically. The lights stayed flickering on a lot longer than they would usually. Finally, the devil was gone when the lights came on and fully illuminated the bathroom. I must have run back to the stairs after that, but I was so scared I don't remember. 
My sister remembers me running down the stairs yelling, The devil is in the bathroom! She said she remembers running up the stairs to the bathroom and moving the shower curtain around to see if there was anything there. The next thing I remember was my mom walking into the house and me running to her, telling her the devil was in the bathroom. But she didn't take me too seriously. So I ran outside to my dad. He picked me up and held me in his arms and I told him that I saw the devil in the bathroom. I remember him saying to me, I believe you. And that was the very first paranormal experience that I can remember. I think I saw the devil by Stewie Guy. This is my personal story of when I was about eight years old visiting my grandpa and his housekeeper in the slums of Mexico. There is some backstory, and I want to describe the neighborhood where this occurs. My grandpa's house is an old red brick and cement single story square house with a road in front running parallel. This gray brick road has a cement walkway on each side, and similar looking houses are in front and beside my grandpa's house. If you stand at the front door looking towards the road across the street to the right side, there is an eight foot tall red brick wall and a giant mansion resembling the Alamo building. The windows are open archways with no glass, it is three stories tall, L-shaped, and is a corner house. It has been abandoned for quite some time, and my cousins have gone inside and had a scary encounter. I tagged along, but that is another story. I wake up late at night in the cot and look around the room. I feel wide awake as I look towards the fogged up window with the street light shining through. The urge to find my older brother, who is around 15 years old, who hangs out with his cool cousins on the left corner of the block, so I open the door and walk towards the front door. It's not locked, so I open it and step outside onto the sidewalk. There is the sound of a slightly busy city, but no one is on the street. The stars are out tonight. I feel excited and start running left in the middle of the brick road. I get closer to the corner store where my brother usually hangs out, but it looks closed. I stop, turn, and run back to my grandparents' house, thinking he may have gone the other way to the right of my grandpa's house. I get a little nervous as I pass my grandpa's house. I can see the giant brick gate of the mansion on my left-hand side. The road is dimly lit up with a warm yellow glow from the street lamps. The lights seem spaced out because there is a dark section as I walk. The road begins to go uphill. I see someone standing at the top of the hill in the center of the road. My eyes adjust as I get closer. It's the silhouette of a tall man wearing a large hat shaped like a flat mariachi hat. The figure is pitch black on the road, standing absolutely still. I see that it has glowing red eyes and it's staring deeply at me. I feel the evil radiating off this thing and believing that it was grinning at me. I turned around and run back towards my grandpa's house, close the door, jump in the bed, and fall asleep as soon as I lay down. I don't know if it was from shock or if I was really just that tired. I never told anybody about this encounter as I felt that it would make everybody feel like I was weird or just seeing things. But after hearing many stories here in the swamp, I now believe that what I saw was likely the devil. What If by Nicole E. Hi, my name is Nicole, and I'm from a small country town in Arkansas. I won't name the city because it's a tiny town and everyone knows each other. I want to share a story with you that my grandmother told me that still makes the hairs on my neck stand up. It may not be terrifying to you, but knowing how this could have turned out makes me very nervous. My grandmother was a strong and independent lady, so she wasn't distraught when my grandfather would leave town from time to time to work. They lived in a small house with only three bedrooms. The house was incredibly secluded, located in the backwoods of the area. This is my grandmother on my mother's side. My mother wasn't even born yet, 
and if this particular night turned out any differently, she may have never have been born. Well, this was a scorching day, and at the time my grandmother only had two oldest uncles and two aunts, who were small children. Usually, they would love to relax and sleep on the porch when it was boiling outside. On this particular night, my grandmother had made her sleeping place on the porch but decided to sit up for a while. When the kids were all finally asleep, she just sat in the corner of the porch enjoying the cool breeze and gazing at the stars. I remember my grandmother telling me she wasn't sure why, but she couldn't bring herself to get out of the chair and lay down that night. Sometime around midnight, she started to doze off and said to herself, Okay, let's get up from here and go to bed. Just then, she saw something rise over the porch, right where her head would have been if she was laying down sleeping. After sitting there momentarily, she just thought that she was tired and told herself, I was getting up in five minutes and going to sleep. A few minutes later, something raised again, but this time a little higher, and now towering over one of the kids. The thing was raised back down again before she could make out what it exactly was. Now, she was worried, but couldn't determine what it was. It was all black with a slender face. She continued to stay in the corner until she saw the thing slowly creeping up the steps, coming up on the porch. At this moment, she jumped up, and this thing jumped like it was shocked she was there. It bounced off the steps and ran around the house. My grandmother quickly awakened the children and went inside, ensuring all the windows and doors were closed and locked. My grandmother decided never to sleep outside again. She always wondered why she hadn't lied down that night. My grandmother never stayed up that late, and what would have happened if she had gone to sleep that night? Later in the week, my grandmother saw a man walking through her yard, saying he was hunting. This wasn't that strange back in Arkansas, did I mention this was somewhere in the 1930s? The man told my grandmother a black panther was stalking him the other night while walking home through the woods. The man hopes to track the panther down and kill it before it kills him. These are pretty thick woods. The thing could be standing just feet away and you couldn't see it. My grandmother thinks that whatever raised over her porch that night coming to drag her off could have potentially been maybe that black panther. But whatever it was, it was terrifying and I'm glad it didn't get her. She lived to be over a hundred years old. And to the end of her days, she always wondered, what if? Unexplained Voices from Childhood by Space Yoda When I was a little kid, around seven or eight years old, I was running out my front door when I heard my grandmother's voice call out clear as day and angrily say, Jordan, come here. I was really confused, so I went back inside and looked upstairs for her and downstairs, but she was nowhere to be found. I looked in the garden out back and by the linen hangers in the side yard. I could not find her. Turns out she was at my neighbor's house getting a basket of seasonal fruit. I asked her if she had called me to the house just now and she said no, and she's been at Pete's the whole time. Later in the day, she left me and my older brother home alone while she ran some errands. He and I were outside playing catch in the front yard, and when we went inside, my room was completely turned upside down. Only my room though. Everybody else's room was completely normal and untouched. My drawers were open and my clothes were tossed about. My closet doors were open and all the contents of my closet were strewn all over my floor. My bedding was yanked off the bed and my little TV was not only static but was playing some sort of weird melody. On my bed was a cup of water sitting perfectly upright and centered. I called my grandma thinking somebody broke in but wondered why only my room would look the way it did. Anyway, she came home, helped me clean up and reassured me that everything was fine. That evening, my brother and I were playing with my grandparents' webcam since it had funny filters on it. One of them turned the saturation on high and the shadows were very prominent. My brother was acting out some sort of Star Wars thing and he disappeared into the shadows. As he did that, another shadow ran across the hall and into my room. 
He watched the video back and told me not to look unless I wanted nightmares. Needless to say, I was very freaked out. That's all I remember from when I was a kid, but I still think about it a lot and wonder what it might have been. So if anybody has any thoughts on what this was, it would be greatly appreciated to know your thoughts in the comments. Grey Creature on the Road by Anonymous For context, I live in rural northwest Arkansas. I was in the back seat of a car riding through the woods this past December when I saw it. It was tall and walking on all fours, but its hind legs brought its rear up a good foot above its head. It was about as tall as a person. It was fragile and bony, but it looked like it had a grayish pale skin. It was walking just behind the tree line on the side of the road. The car was going about 40 miles per hour on a straight road, so I had a few solid seconds to look at the thing before we fully passed it. I knew it wasn't just an optical illusion. I saw the thing clear as day. My family said it might have been some sort of deer with chronic wasting disease, but it was much taller than any deer I have ever seen in the area, and its body wasn't shaped like a deer. It had a humanoid face that I can't quite describe other than it looking like a tiny human head, but with something kind of wrong with it, like sickly gray and emaciated. There were no antlers or anything, just a freaky face. Its mouth was hanging open agape, and it had solid black eyes. It was honestly terrifying, and it still makes me pretty freaked out. I've been trying to figure out what it may have been, but I haven't found anyone who's seen something matching that description. My closest guess was that it might be a Wendigo or a Skimwalker, so I decided to share this story here with the Swamp to see if anybody might have an idea of what I had seen. Weird Story My Sister Told Me by Maggie A. My big sister just told me a story that I'm not sure how to process, but I believe her 100%. She was 15 years old, back in the late 80s or early 90s. One day, she walked into our suburban Michigan two-car garage home where there was only one car parked. As she turned the corner, there was a small white man, about three and a half feet tall standing there, looking directly at her. She froze, not understanding what she was seeing, when it said to her, Well, hello, young lady, then vanished in front of her eyes like it was never there. Completely freaked out and still not understanding what happened, she ran to our dad and told him. Naturally, he checked the garage and there was no evidence of anything out of the, the, out of the normal. My dad doesn't really believe in anything paranormal or supernatural. He's a total unrelenting skeptic. He just admitted that he believed her and that he remembers how incredibly mortified my sister was and mentioned that her story hadn't changed a bit in the 40 years since then. Had anyone ever heard of anything like this before? Like a small little white man who looked very similar to Gandalf the White with long white hair parted down the middle, long white beard and in some sort of robes or garb. I always believed in the paranormal, but this really solidified it. By Anonymous 2009, I was interested in the paranormal, since I had many paranormal experiences growing up. I found a website that held ghost tours at the old Southwestern General Hospital. I was excited and ready to go on a ghost hunt. The group that held the ghost tour was named Ghost, or Ghost Hunters of South Texas. The group was professional, and they used many of the items that paranormal researchers used at the time. Before the tour, they showed us proof that they have captured in previous investigations while investigating the property. EVPs included a little boy saying, play with me please, and a woman with a southern accent responding to questions. The woman is said to be in an old time dress, and sometimes old time nurse attire. After the tour, the group said they were having openings for new members, 
and the new members would be tested and would be considered in maybe being part of the new team. I was quick to join and try out. I made the team. The team would have private group ghost hunts, so we would have the building to ourselves. The third floor was used as a hospice type of area. The building has four floors. The first, second, and fourth floor were left abandoned, and they look like a scene out of a horror movie. Hospital beds lay in rooms dusty and unused. Many had dates from 1995 and before. I even found a death log that had many names and dates. The most active areas were the fourth and second floor. The fourth floor had a baby nursery, and many rooms that were once used for families that would be welcoming new babies. One EVP that was caught in that area was one of crying babies. At the time the EVP was caught, there were no babies in the building, and it was after midnight sometime when it was caught. Also on the fourth floor, there was a long hallway with empty patient rooms. In that hallway, shadows were always seen running or moving. The second floor was an old area. Also, many shadow figures were seen in this area. When doing research on the deaths in the building, I came up with what looked like to be a nurse who was crushed to death when a malfunction with the elevator happened years ago. During the time I was a part of this group, we investigated this building tons of times. I might even care to say maybe over a hundred. I also led ghost tours in the building with other members. I witnessed shadows, disembodied voices, screams, and one time heard a female humming a song only to find the room empty and dark. I've seen videos of doors opening on their own with no wind or people in the building. Also, the third floor had employees that would see things and hear things very often. Patients also complained of a kid running in their room or a man standing over their bed just looking at them, only to disappear. Over the years, I gained experience and loved what I did. As a group, we investigated many places such as schools, homes, and cemeteries in El Paso. We also got to investigate the old Asarco smelter before it was demolished several years later. I got to ghost hunt with people from Ghost Hunters and Ghost Hunters International. I met many celebrities and the group had them take their own personal ghost tours. It was fun and I grew a thick skin for fearing anything that goes bump in the dark. One of my favorite places to investigate was Southwestern General Hospital. I never believed in being followed home. One night after investigating, I was at my apartment eating on my couch and watching TV. I had my hallway light on near the front door that was visible from where I was sitting. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow of a person on the wall near the door. I turned and saw the shadow in full form. It was about six foot tall and completely black. Then, not even a second later, the shadow moved as if it was running down my hallway to my bedroom. I froze in horror, thinking somebody was in my apartment. I got up and walked to my bedroom. Nobody was there. I searched the whole house up and down, and then I thought to myself, Maybe I'm just going crazy. I soon went to bed a few minutes later. It was probably about 3.20 a.m. when I felt my bed shaking. I woke up to my sheets being pulled off me very slowly and deliberately. I tried to move, but I just could not. My sheet slid very slowly off me towards the floor. I could not move, and I started to hear growling in my right ear. From the corner of my eye, I could see something moving near my head on the right of me. It was on my pillow. I could only see from the peripheral vision that it had hair. It was hairy and brown. If I could compare it to something, I would say Chewbacca from Star Wars type hair. It was moving, very slowly, but obviously very deliberately. It was growling as well. My eyes started to water up with tears. I tried to move my arm, but I just couldn't. I could only move my fingers. The blanket was still being pulled off me little by little until it hit the floor and I was no longer covered by my sheet. I felt the hairy thing moving right next to me and the growling grew louder. Then suddenly, I was able to sit up and I turned and looked to see what was there next to me. The hairy thing was gone, but I could see the imprint of where it had sat right next to me just a moment ago. It was the size of a full-grown cat. Then I looked around the room to gather my sanity. I don't own a cat. My sheet was on the floor, and my eyes were still watery. I asked myself, 
maybe it was just sleep paralysis. I found it hard to sleep that night, since I lived alone in that apartment. The next day I had a girl over to my apartment. I was seeing her from school. I was playing PlayStation and she asked if she could take a nap in my bed. I said of course. She went to my bed and fell asleep. Around 20 minutes later, she suddenly came back to my living room in tears. She said, uh, I have to leave now. I asked her what was happening and what was wrong. What she said shocked me. She said that something shook the bed and woke her up. She could not move, and then something was growling and started getting close to her ear. Then the bed went down as if somebody lied down next to her. She tried to scream for me and could not. Then she felt as if somebody was breathing on her neck as the growling grew louder. She said it lasted about two minutes, and then she was finally able to move. Once she was able to move, she ran to me in the living room. After she explained this, I grabbed her stuff and helped her leave. I did not tell her what happened to me the night before, but I had that same exact experience, and what happened to her was enough proof that something was not right. I could not explain what was happening. First thing that came to mind that something probably followed me home from the hospital. After a few days, all the activity suddenly stopped. Only when I would go in on investigations, I would see shadows in my apartment, and then they would just go away. I loved what I did, and the only time I feared the paranormal was this moment. I no longer ghost hunt, and the group no longer gets together. Southwest General Hospital was purchased and is now remodeled and is in use. I can only imagine what the employees of the LTAC go through by being in that building. Every now and then I drive down Cotton and pass the building. I miss the days of being part of Ghost El Paso. If you are ever in El Paso after stopping by at Chico's Tacos, be sure to pass by the old building by the Star on the Mountain formerly known as Southwest General Hospital. A Skeptic Turned Believer by Anonymous I would like to start by saying that while I am interested in the paranormal, I tend to be skeptical and prefer to think things out rationally before dismissing every little thing as a ghost or the like. This experience, however, has no logical explanation I can think of. I am new here, and as well, I apologize in advance if I'm not doing this correctly. So, let's get into this. I was 17 and it was mid-October, nearing Halloween. My family had gone to a small, rural town to meet up with some good friends. We were going to get dinner and catch up for old times' sake as my siblings and I had grown up with the children of the other families. After dinner, the parents stayed at the bar drinking, and those of us who were not of legal drinking age were starting to get a little bored. That is when one of my friends brought up the local cemetery. Apparently, there is a cemetery in this town that is said to be haunted. I'm pretty positive that some ghost hunter paranormal type show did an episode about it or something, but the legends are said to have been around since before that. The story goes that a group of teenage boys were wandering into the graveyard one Halloween night with the intention of causing trouble and maybe stirring up some spooky ghost action in celebration of Halloween. After messing around for a while with no unexplained phenomena, they decided to sit in on top of the mausoleum which is basically just a big tomb built up around a coffin instead of burying it in the ground. They were about to call it quits and head home when suddenly, unseen hands seemed to push one of the boys off the top of the tomb and into the ground. All the boys were obviously scared and hightailed it out of there, all of them feeling an eerie, ominous energy following them around for weeks after the incident. There have also been numerous reports of orbs, headstones inexplicably moving, or disappearing altogether, ghostly apparitions, inscriptions being changed, flashes of light, strange noises, the whole works. I, of course, was more than excited to check it out. We arrived at the cemetery well after dark, and one of my girlfriends, we will call her Emma, and I were the only two brave ones enough to go in. We hopped right out of the car, careful to be as inconspicuous as we could since we did not want the police showing up and ruining our ghost hunting experience. We headed toward the entrance. It was chilly and a bit windy, as autumn in Wisconsin tends to be. We gripped each other's hands and started down the gravel path. As soon as we passed the fence that surrounded the plot of land, everything seemed to get very still and very quiet. We could not even hear the wind anymore. 
which was strange as it had been breezy as we got out of the car. It was so silent that even whispering in our steps in the gravel seemed, pun absolutely not intended, loud enough to wake the dead. Though there were no lights in or near the cemetery, there was enough moonlight filtering through the clouds to allow us to see well. We soon realized we had no idea where the fabled haunted mausoleum was, but kept walking anyway. We made a random left turn, and lo and behold, there it was, about 30 yards or so in front of us. Surprisingly, we had great luck, right? I don't think so. As we approached, I began to feel almost an electric sort of energy in my fingers and hands, but I wrote this off as just nerves or something due to breaking the law. We reached the tomb, and this thing is absolutely huge. It was easily twice my height, at the very least, and made of weathered gray stone with moss and lichen growing sparsely on it. We stare at it for a moment, and Emma whispers, You should touch it. Being the big bad ghost hunter I am, I oblige. There is really nothing remarkable about the cool roughness of the stone, so I decide to take it a step further and hop up to sit up on the lip of the curved top of the thing. Again, nothing happens, so I jokingly whisper shout, If there's anyone here, any spirits or anything, come on out. After listening in silence for a second or two, I think, F it, and make my way to the very top where the kid is rumored to have been pushed off by ghostly hands. I have Emma snap a photo or two of me before climbing back down. Slightly disappointed by the lack of spooky encounters, we agree to head out and are about to do just that when we see a pair of headlights slowly creeping down the road that borders one side of the graveyard. We immediately assume someone noticed us and called the cops, so we crouch down behind some bushes with the mausoleum directly to our left. Both of us are completely silent except for our breathing as we watch the vehicle slowly make its way down the street. I am watching its taillights turn the corner when I hear a low, creepy, menacing laugh coming from right behind me. It sounded so strange, like it was a few feet away but also right in my ear at the same time. I'm freaked out, and I'm about to chalk it up to adrenaline-induced hallucination, when Emma, who is standing to my left, whispers, Hey... Did you hear that? My blood ran cold as I slowly nod a silent. Yes, I did. I cautiously turn my head to one direction and try to see if I can hear it. I kid you not. I didn't hear anything, but what I did see was a dark figure stand up from behind one of the headstones not ten feet away from us. I scream bloody murder and somehow end up on the ground as the next thing I know, Emma is pulling at my arm, shouting, We have to run! We need to get out of here! Come on! I let her pull me to my feet and lead me blindly by the hand. We are full out sprinting, tripping over gravestones and plants and who knows what else in the dark. We cannot even find the exit in our panic. We finally reach a gap in the fence and I can feel the tears streaming down my face as I run for my life down the middle of the road not even paying attention to the oncoming headlights until I nearly run into them. Luckily, it was the car containing the rest of our friends, and we rip the door open and throw ourselves inside screaming, Go! Go! Please just drive! Before we even bothered to sit in an actual seat or shut the door. I cannot for the life of me remember who was driving, but I think our panic and terror shook them enough that they did exactly what we asked of them and sped away back to the bar. They kept asking us what happened and if we were okay but we would not calm down enough to answer them until we were back inside the bar and sat down. Still shaking and out of breath, we recounted our story to all of them, drunk parents included. I think a lot of them were skeptical, and honestly, I would have been too if I had not experienced it myself. In the weeks that followed, I felt the same eerie energy the boys in the legend describe hanging over my head. Personally, I attribute it more to paranoia after being scared out of my mind by something I could not actually see but it made me feel uneasy nonetheless. It has been a few years since this happened, and I still cannot think of a single, logical explanation for what actually happened that night. While I have no idea how credible anyone else's reported experiences on this show are, I know we were without a doubt the only people in that graveyard, or even on the streets for that matter, and we would have heard someone trying to sneak up on us. The sound of that laugh was so unnatural. I cannot get it out of my head. Even now, 
I have never been more scared than I was that night. And I now know what people mean when they talk about not being able to fully believe in the paranormal until you have experienced it firsthand. Anyway, I just thought I would share this experience with you. I hope you enjoyed it.